to introduce our speaker, Ashley Busby. She is an artist. She lives in Albany, New York. She completed her MFA, Masters of Fine Arts at Texas Tech University in 2016. Um, she got a certification in art history. She interned with Shumla during her grad program and she cont continues to collaborate with us in studying the painting process of the Pegasus River style rock art. Um, she currently works for Russell Sage College in Troy, New York um, in the retention and academic advising area and continues her studio art practice um, in the Northeast, most recently showing at Katona um, Museum of Art and Site in Brooklyn. And today she will be talking about um, all of the various visual um, kind of applications and ways that the painters use paint to, to really get their point across in the beautiful art that we study. Um, and so I will thank you all for being here. Please turn yourself on mute. Please use the chat feature to ask your questions um, as you're thinking of them. And we will um, have those at the end for the question and answer. Take it away, Ashley. Yes, um, let me make sure is the correct screen sharing, Jessica. That looks great. Perfect. Uh, well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Jessica. Um, and uh, thank you. I want to start by giving a, a thank you to the Shumo staff for inviting me to talk today. And um, thank you to everyone who has um, joined us this afternoon. Uh, and I'm really excited to be presenting some of my research um, today on the compositional analysis of the Pecos reverse style murals. And today I'm going to be focusing mostly on Fate Bell and Halo Shelter, which are the two sites that are part of the Hearthstone project that I'll talk a little bit more about later in the presentation. Um, so I'll just reintroduce myself really quick. My name is Ashley Busby, currently living in Albany, New York, and I received my MFA from uh, Texas Tech in 2016, and I got a certification in art history with an emphasis in Mesco Mesoamerican art. And after interning with Shuma in 2016, I'm still collaborating with the team, studying the painting process of these works of art. Uh, using my experience as a studio artist, I work on site with the team to analyze composition, types of mark making, and how the artists use the natural rock surface in their works of art. Uh, today I'm going to talk about um, specific visual elements in Halo Shelter and Fate Bell and the function of different types of marks they made. And I'm also going to show an in-depth formal analysis of the work and how that makes it evident that the planning and skill uh, of the artist was very sophisticated. And the careful compositions of these murals, as well as the artist painted marks, served as a vehicle for expressing the experience of the Lower Pecos people. So the focus of my talk today is going to be on the pictographs of the Lower Pecos Canyonlands located in Southwest Texas and Northern Mexico. These murals are known for their diversity of figures, of styles, and arrangement. This map on the left shows the region's location circled in red. And due to a unique combination of ecological and geological factors, rock shelters in the Lower Pecos contain some of the best preserved remnants of hunter-gatherer ways of life. This is dating back from 13,000 years ago to European contact. As a result, this region that we're studying is considered one of the most significant archaeological regions in the world. The rock art of this region found in canyon shelters is incredibly preserved. So here you can see four styles of this region, which are used individually or sometimes in combination with each other to create intricate combinations. The multicolored Pecos River style is one of these four dominant styles, and it's the most visually complex and prominent in this region. This style is going to be the focus of my talk today, but other styles seen in this region, as shown here, are red monochrome, red linear, and historic period. These are generally just one color, and they're less stylistically complex. And just to note, the rock art sites that I'm going to talk about today in this presentation are just few out of hundreds in Val Verde County that are studied by Shuma. So I wanted to start by giving some insight to the painting process, some of the potential tools and techniques the artist used. And in producing these murals, the artists would have had to go through a lot of preparation. And in this uh, process, their knowledge of the land was essential. Their, 
materials would have been collected from the landscape around them, including earth pigments, binders from animal fat, and emulsifiers likely from yucca plant. And they would use these implements for applying, they would need implements for applying the paints they were making. So they would collect things like sticks or brushes made from animal hair, plant fibers, and even feathers. Um, so you can see the stalk of and the leaves of the yucca or sotol plant on the top right, they could have been dried and shaved down to be used as some of those really fine points you see in the murals. And they also could have used leaves or animal skins to block off certain areas or use them kind of like we would use a stencil. So in addition to any ritually significant actions that they performed, the painters would have to gather their materials from the landscape. They would have to think of the colors they were going to use, mix enough paint to cover the entire surface, and also plan out their composition. And this would actually be in addition to thinking of the curvature of the wall or working around any natural features on the rock wall. The Pecos River style murals of this region vary in size. So some are pretty small and they're tucked away in, in enclosures, but some are huge and they're spanning up to 100 feet wide and 20 feet tall. And to paint on high areas of the rock wall, a type of scaffolding system would have been essential. So here you can see an image from Black Cave and there's a group of figures circled on the top left. They're really high up on the rock wall. And on that, this detail on the right, you can see the really crisp lines and dots that would have required to, the artist to be close up to that surface to create. Another example would be these massive figures at Panther Cave. They're intricately, intricately painted and they start from the bottom and extend far up on the rock wall. Painting these figures from the ground level would have not been possible without a system of supports or platforms. And here you can see the custom scaffolding Schumel uses in the field to reach these parts of the panel. With help of this scaffolding, I was able to have a closer proximity to this scene at Fate Bell. And I was able to look at things like consistency of paint, uh, look up really close up to some of the edges of the lines that were made, and also take some pretty detailed measurements. Schumel's research has demonstrated that these works of art are not random assemblages of images, but were carefully made compositions. It's clear from the amount of preparation involved that these paintings weren't arbitrarily made, but would have taken days or weeks to prepare for and create. And studying the complexity and execution of these paintings is essential to my research as part of the Hearthstone Project introduced by Schumla in 2021. The Hearthstone Project is named for the fire hearth, an important symbol in Native American culture. And the project's foundation is rooted in both science and the humanities. It's partially funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities and the National Science Foundation. It involves a multidisciplinary approach to studying the rock art and in the field, this involves the Shumla crew gathering data from murals on site, while I conduct a formal analysis of the art. In addition to other important documentation, the archaeologists are taking context photos, they're taking figure photography, and they're using microscopy to record the complexity of paint layering. In taking 50 times microscopic images of paint layers using a digital microscope, like the one on the bottom right, um, this has revealed like that the lower Pecos paintings are carefully planned compositions with a very specific color arrangement. These microscopic images have allowed us to see how the paint layer is layered on the rock surface. And by taking hundreds of points across the painting, there's a consistent order of white over yellow, over red, over black. Above, you can see a microscopic example of red paint layered over black paint. And this has been a breakthrough discovery for understanding how these works of art were composed. In this rendering of White Shaman done by Dr. Boyd, it shows the layering of colors digitally. First, all of the black, then all of the red was painted. Then all of the yellow and then the white paint was applied. And this pattern is consistent with almost all the sites Schumel has microscopically documented in the Lower Pecos. After collecting all of this important data in the field, the team continues its work in the lab and the archeologists upload and organize important data so it's available for future study. 
From this data, Dr. Carolyn Boyd can create renderings of the murals uh, and create extensive visual databases. And they include information about location, composition, and paint order. And you can see the, her working on one on the top left. And the center image, you see Schumel's chemist, Karen Steelman, preparing paint samples for radiocarbon isotope measurement in order to obtain an age determination. And on the right are measurement maps I created in field with notes and document figure numbers. And also just to note today, you're gonna to hear me refer to specific figures in scenes when I'm looking at the panels. And these are numbers that have been assigned to those figures by Schumla researchers. As mentioned earlier, an important part of the Hearthstone project is bringing together archeological findings with an analysis of the Lower Pecos paintings as works of art. So in addition to my on-site measurements and observations about how these paintings were made, I'm also concerned with placing these works of art in the larger art historical context. In this endeavor, it's important to reframe how we think of art making for the Lower Pecos painters. The study of art is a Western development with its own biases. And in this talk, I'm gonna use terms like line, space, and surface, since this is the language we as art users have to discuss about how art is made. But these art concepts were viewed very differently by the painters at the Lower Pecos. These murals were sacred. They were not just things to be looked at, but active and part of the landscape around them. So of course, representing forms and organizing space held different meanings for these artists than, and different from what we're familiar with in Western art. So rather than a progression of technique or realism or likeness, it's important to examine the rock art as its own artistic development. And this quote, I think, captures the sentiment really well um, by Ernst Grombrich. And it's, he says, the whole story of art is not a story in technical proficiency, but a story of changing ideas and requirements. While the concepts of art were very, very different for the painters in the Lower Pecos, we have evidence of how purposefully they created marks, images, and figures in relation to each other. So just to give a little context, um, I wanted to show these two prominent undergraduate art history textbooks. First, I learned from um, Art Through the Ages, um, but Gombrich's The Story of Art is also an, another popular one. And you can see the distribution of material they cover. So um, we have about seven pages for 26,000 years of art history. And we have 12 pages for a similar amount of time in The Story of Art. And these beginnings of art chapter, they usually discuss notable prehistoric works. And of course, there's an emphasis on some of the most European or some of the most known European sites and works of art. And these chapters are looking to recount a timeline or a story of art unfolding. And while there is some insightful commentary and some formal analysis or discussion of function, these books note that there's much unknown about rock art and the reason for its creation. So I'm a visual person, so I wanted to put this in a timeline. Um, so again, you just can see the density that these textbooks address these periods of art. Um, you can see such a discrepancy between the extensive scholarship beginning from Greek, Roman, Egyptian art. That's what we call the ancient civilization starting around 2000 BC, a little earlier than that, uh, all the way to present. And then you see the almost 26, 27,000 years of prehistoric art that's addressed in just that short chapter. And so I think this example just shows that there's need of more scholarship, um, in addition to the wonderful scholarship that's being done to some of the earliest and most important works of art made by humans. So with this in mind, um, I, I, I believe there's a need for continued study of this, especially rock art. Um, because painting has been a tradition that humans continue to express themselves through, and it's endured for millennia. And my research is rooted in studying um, some of the more formal compositional elements um, using a formal analysis, like in this painting on the left of St. Bavo. Um, this, in this painting, I mark uh, symmetry, scale, and perspective. But I'm also more interested, or I'm also interested in more contemporary art theories about surface, um, so, for example, uh, in this painting by Franz Klein, you can see the act of mark making um, that the artist uses by isolating gestural painted marks in a monochrome space. 
Well, I have initial questions before going to each site. Um, I think the most exciting part is leaving the site with more questions. So when I first started looking at Halo Shelter, uh, this was the first site I looked at for the Hearthstone project. I was really excited to hone my process and determine what aspects needed more study that were specific to this site. Uh, how did the artist conceptualize space? What compositional elements are significant? And what tools and techniques were needed to execute this painting? In the field, I learned more about the unique mark making of each panel, any motifs the artist used, and how they organized the figures in the scene. To start to answer these questions, I start with my preliminary assessment of the site. So if possible, I use a digital rendering on the site like seen below. Uh, these are created uh, by Dr. Boyd using multiple layers in Photoshop to map out every single figure, what the figure is identified as, and the color order of the rock art site. I also use D-Stretch to pull out as much information from the painting as possible. Uh, it, that, an example of that is shown on the top right. And D-Stretch is an application that uses filters to manipulate the saturation and color of photos, allowing me to see more than I could normally see with my just my own vision. And finally, I begin my formal assessment. So I look for the boundaries of the main composition, which involves looking for where the dense arrangement of figures is, and then generally where the figures are smaller and begin to taper off on the edges. And this helps me to establish the frame of the scene. After establishing the central scene or region of the composition, I begin a series of measurements that help me identify areas of obvious symmetry. And I also look at things like line widths, so I can see if the artist used a single tool across many figures. And then also looking at other important figure relationships using space or overlapping. And also during this process, I just wanted to know, I use both a solid wood ruler and I use a soft tape measurer just to make sure that my measurements aren't being skewed by the curvature of the wall. I also document types of paint application and how the painter utilized brush strokes or tools to indicate a specific action. And I take these photographs with a macro camera to make sure they're as sharp as possible. Uh, as discussed in mine and Dr. Boyd's paper from 2021, um, the paper we wrote about mark making and speech breath, that each mark is painted on the surface, it carries meaning. And so just to quote, we can see the hand of the artists, the physical act of mark making and the images they created, whether produced using aggressive or carefully articulated brushstrokes, the painting reveals the artist's movement. So in that vein, um, the Lower Pecos painters used a variety of marks to communicate things such as movement, you can see here where the artist painted the mark from left to right. So you can see the thickest part of the mark on the left. And then as it the brush moves to the right, you can see it tapering off and terminating. And then on the left here, you can see the artist using gestural black paint to fill the framing serpentine line with energetic active marks. After field work, I'm able to refine my data. So I create a clear hand-drawn copy of my measurement map that's not covered in dirt <laughs> from the field. And I add extra notes and observations. And during this time, I'm able to finalize what compositional elements I wanna make uh, individual maps of. So using the graphics and Teak tablet shown on the bottom, I'm able to pull out specific visual elements for an in-depth look at how the artists used each compositional element in isolation. Also, at this point, I'm starting to look for if I've seen these compositional elements in other sites to find points of comparison. I also conduct studio tests that give me insight to how certain marks were created. So here you can see a splatter test I did uh, about two years ago. And I did this test to help me understand the proximity to the wall and the angle of the paintbrush that would have been needed to make these splatter marks. So on the example on the left, I did a top or sorry, a bottom left to top right angle for my splatter. And note at the point of impact, there's some smaller dots, but as they go to the top right, they become more elongated. They almost look like painted marks. Um, I wanted to compare this to this example on the right uh, of splatter paint from Cedar Springs. You can see here that the dots are more circular and they have kind of a speckled appearance. So they're not oval like, like the ones you see up here. And to me, this indicates that the artist was likely straight on when they applied these dots. 
And also note um, how clean the space is between these splatter paths. Unlike my example here, where even though I tried to apply the splatter in paths, you can see a lot of stray dots. Whereas you don't really see that, you see clear paths here without a lot of excess paint. So to me, that um, could be an indication that they used uh, some kind of stenciling or way to block these areas off before applying that splatter paint. Uh, another studio test I did uh, was a thin and thick line application test. So I um, got some pieces of limestone rock and tried to replicate the surface of what the rock, uh, rock wall would have looked like. Um, and I did these tests to try and understand the effort that would have been required to make different types of lines. So with the large brush on the left, I was able to cover a lot of surface really quickly with just a few strokes. So I did that line in about 20 seconds, but you can see how I lost the, uh, the fine line of the edge pretty quickly. And then the small brush on the right, it took significantly longer and I had to adjust the brush constantly so that I could keep that line straight across the irregular surface. That line took me two minutes and approximately 95 brush strokes. Um, so you can see the amount of time it would have required to make something, a fine line that precise. Um, and I also wanted to include some examples from Halo Shelter. So on the right, you see an example of that fine line that would have required a lot of time. And on the left, you see an example of um, a pretty brushy looking figure. He was likely painted with more action and not quite so much focus on the precision that the lines had on the right. So from all of this analysis that I do in my studio and um, at my desk, I try to connect all of these things for my analysis of the site. So um, as I stated earlier, my first site for the project was Halo. And my first observation from this mural was the huge variety of mark making and types of line. Despite this wide range of mark making and paint application, the scene is still visually cohesive. So the artist weaves in all these different types of marks together to create a visually consistent scene. And in addition to the variety of marks made, uh, the mural follows the paint order of all black, all red, then all yellow, then all white. Anthropomorphic figures become more visually prominent as they cluster to the middle of the scene, which I've established as the center right at that water seep where that like red faded area is. At this site, there's examples of the artist using, <laughs> at this site, there's also examples of the artist using scale. Um, I've also noted use of serpentine or wavy lines that are used to create a frame around the composition uh, along with the prevalent zigzag motif. So I wanted to start with my symmetry map here. Uh, in the central part of the scene that I've circled, um, there's a lot of really important symmetries. So the location of the water seep is a crucial part of the composition. I've marked that with the black line here. And the water seep region is also the location of the highest anthropomorph or human-like figure on this panel. And I've marked that with the white X. I've established this as the central point. And between here, you can see a symmetry between A16 and A10, which are spaced evenly apart from this black line where the water seep is. Ashley, I'm going to stop you for one second just to answer a quick question that I saw in the chat that oh, people might be wondering about. All the little blue marks all over this, this picture. Yes. Those are the, the figure numbers, but they're so tiny you can't see them. So this, I just wanted people to understand. All that little blue stuff is not paint. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Thank you so much for clarifying. Yes, they're not paint. They're just um, the notations that Dr. Boyd, Boyd put on each figure as um, to identify what the figure is. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and also this central point bisects this thick wavy line here. Um, it's called it's E10 noted. And in addition to that, you can see symmetry between two framing elements. So you see E2 and E28. E2 is that big wavy line around the main central figure, or the main area where the figures are. And then E28 is a uh, wavy line on the left side of the panel. And these are the same distance apart from that water seep. So you can see here that the artist is using symmetry from these framing lines of the composition to show important visual markers. 
Um, to continue on about framing elements, I wanted to show a little better of a map here. Um, so the artist uses a series of wavy serpentine lines and negative space to create a frame around the central part of the scene. Um, so here you can see E2, it's enveloping the central part of the scene. And all through here is negative space uh, to give um, a little bit of room for these figures before they start getting dense in the center here. And also on the left here, you can see a group of additional zigzag and serpentine lines, and they have negative space in between them. This could be an indicator of how to start viewing the scene, and it creates a visual entry point for the viewer. Another important find that I found at Halo Shelter is the artist use of scale. So by focusing on the zigzag motif, I was able to identify these examples in this composition. So at the bottom right of the panel, I've circled here just so you can see exactly where it is. Um, you can see a group of thickly painted zigzag lines that I've marked in yellow here. And similarly, you can see two groups of zigzags just above the feline figure here, but they're, and they're symmetrically placed in the center of this larger group underneath. Um, but just to note that these zigzags above the feline figure are painted with super finely with a much smaller brush, and it gives that illusion of them being pushed back into the space. On the left, over here, I'm just going to mark here, um, you can see another example of this along the E22 red path, which I've drawn in here. Um, a meet, a, the smallest zigzag can be seen inside a dry applied red portal right back here, and they're super finely painted. Then at the middle point, you can see a medium weight zigzag line. And then, so we have the exact middle point of E22. Um, so this medium weight zigzag line uh, is the exact center. And then at the end point of this red path, you can see a group of zigzags. They have the thickest line work of the three. So this symmetrical sp spacing and progression from thin to medium to thick line with even spacing is another indication of scale. And then the last example of scale I want to share today is um, a set of two zoomorphs or animal-like figures. So you can see two groups of deer here. There's one group at the top and each of these average about 11 centimeters. And they're pretty small in size. They have a, they look like they're faded but I think the red paint application was just lightly applied. And they don't quite have as much detail as this second group of deer at the bottom. And then these deers average about, these deer average about 30 centimeters each wide. So that would make the ones at the bottom about three times larger. And the larger deer are darker red. They have more fine line antlers and they're, they have a textured red line inside their body. So just to show you an, a close-up image of what these look like, you can see this one on the left here, very faded. You can, he's got some appendages, he's got little horns, but so much more detail on these ones in the front. And I believe that's an indication of those deers, the deer coming closer to us while the smaller, more faded deer are being pushed back into the, into the space. And just to give a, um, a close up at some of the variety of line work at Halo Shelter, you can see these two figures illustrate the thick and fine line that we see. So this figure on the left uh, would have been applied with a larger painting tool, and that would have given it the thick opaque coverage. But because of the larger painting tool, you can see some of that precision of the line work is lost, as opposed to this figure on the right that's uh, applied with likely a smaller painting tool. And you can see that these precise lines are used to denote the fingers, um, any appendages or paraphernalia around the figure. And the central anthropomorphic or human-like figure is a great example of how the artist brought these two types of line application together. So this figure is painted with a thick outline. And since we know that the black was painted before the red in this figure, the artist intentionally left gaps inside of the black infill of this so that there would be room to add in the thin red line work here. And note that the artist would have had to use two different painting tools to make this thin line work as opposed to the large brush strokes from the rest of the body. 
these combination line work figures are most of them are located in the center of the panel around that water seep and it really gives this part of the seed more visual emphasis and complexity. In addition to thin and thick lines at Halo Shelter, the artists also used controlled and gestural brushstrokes. So these controlled marks allowed the artists to represent a former figure with more specificity and detail. For example, you can see these two anthropomorphs here. They're painted really carefully, one of them with these tiny hatch lines and then the other with more solid lines. And they, the artist was very um, concerned in preserving the exactness of their outline. And here you can see these gestural marks overlaid at the on the top of these figures. Uh, these marks are often abstract and they have a brushy, urgently painted feel to them. So upon finding some of those, I wanted to map out the gestural marks. Um, so as I showed earlier, you can see some of those overlaid across the center part of the scene. And then also you can see really concentrated gestural markings around the outside framing line I showed earlier. And these lines are made from uh, several different directions and they're overlaid on top of each other. And they indicate that this scene may take place from inside a vital energy that surrounds the group of figures. So all of these compositional tools build complexity in the scene. So applying all the black, the red, then the yellow, then the white, they weave together thick, thin, gestural and precise lines. They use negative space, they use symmetry, they use scale. These elements and many more indicate a sophisticated and skilled system of painting that held meaning for them. In addition to the painting elements, the artist also utilized features occurring on the natural rock surface. So as pointed out earlier, this is the most prominent one at Halo. It's the, the central water seep that covers the tallest anthropomorph. This natural feature is part of the living landscape, interacting with and activating the figures on the panel. And on the same part of this scene, you can see the artist using a rock bulge of the wall to make this figure's hair more prominent. Okay, yes, so in the same area, you can see the rock bulge coming out from the panel and it adds more emphasis to the figure's hair movement. Um, so more recently, I was able to visit H. Hit, uh, Fate Bell Shelter. Why, uh, and while I'm still in the process of analyzing this panel, I just wanted to share a few of my preliminary findings today. Uh, so in this panel, we see again that there's several instances of symmetry and even spacing. This creates a balance in the scene and it gives narrative prominence to that winged anthropomorph figure. The artists also use perspective by overlapping figures and varying size of certain figures. And they also denote um, certain details on the figures to show a direction or also their depth in the scene. And the artist also uses uh, various opacity to reveal or hide certain parts of the composition. So here I just wanted to show my measurement map. This is where I make most of my initial notes and document distances between figures when I'm measuring in the field. And down to the centimeter, you can see the exactness that the artist painted certain figures. So I wanted to start with some of the uh, instances of symmetry and even spacing. Um, so here marked in that the yellow line is the center of the winged anthropomorphic figure. And you can see that the inside of the wings and the outside of the wings are both the exact same distance from the figure center. You can also see the use of symmetrical spacing outside of this figure. So on the right side of the panel, there's three evenly spaced enigmatic figures, and they are each 86 centimeters apart, and they hover above the serpentine line here on the right side. And this even spacing uh, would have indicated would have required some form of measuring to make sure that the same distance apart was uh, if the distance apart was the same between each figure. Another example of measured spacing is seen inside the body of the winged anthropomorphic figure. So using D stretch, I was able to pull out, um, you can detect four circular shapes inside of the body. These are each five centimeters wide and they're each five centimeters apart. And that indicates that the painter might have not only, they not only used a circular like shape to paint the ring, but they possibly used that as a stencil to space uh, each ring out the next one. Another example on the right, you can see a complex layering of paint along with even spacing of negative bands inside this figure. So just to point out, here's the negative bands here, here, and here where there's no paint. 
So I wanted to show what that might that process would have looked like for the artist. Um, so first the black body would have been painted and then they would have painted that outer part of the body. And then the artist would have blocked, I suspect the artist would have blocked off these negative band spaces. And interestingly, I measured these and they're each six centimeters in width. So I suspect the artist used a type of stencil to block off these areas before painting the rest of those vertical red and yellow lines inside the body. As evidenced here and in other panels, the lower Pecos artists arranged figures intentionally in space to create depth. So here you can see a beautiful example of these five figures surrounding A1, it's that central winged anthropomorph. A3, circled here, is the smallest figure in this scene. He's kind of hard to see, um, but the, hopefully the D-stretch, you can see his feet there. Um, and the right wing is almost completely covering this figure except for his feet. And the feet are, if you notice, they're rendered in kind of this loose gestural way by those stray marks. And this is an indication that it's being pushed back in the scene since it's not as precise. Ahead of this figure, you can see A2, and the direction of his feet is different. It's showing that he's turned instead of being straight on like the previous one. And he's in positioned in front of the scene. And the artist indicates his front placement by not obscuring the head of the figure by the wing, unlike the previous figure who was completely covered. So you can still see his head and those red dots coming out of his mouth. And the artist chose to maintain visibility of this figure despite being overlapped by the wing. Next in the path is A5 and the figure is facing uh, left based on the direction of his feet. And again, you can see the artist's choice to maintain the visibility of the figure. Part of his head is really hard to make out, but you can see most of his side and his back that intersects that wing. And um, completing the circle, you can see A4, and this is the tallest figure in this group. But interestingly, the artist chose to emphasize the visibility of this figure. So you can make out most of his body underneath that wing, despite this figure being compositionally placed behind A1, the central figure. And then completing the scene, you can see A1 and his feet are facing forward, showing his central positioning to complete the circular path around him. And I also wanted to uh, look over some really unique areas of paint application that indicate some shifts in the scene. So the serpentine line at the bottom you can see the right wing of the figure, it starts off being wet applied. So you can see it's kind of got that smooth application. And um, as the line continues and terminates to the right, you can see the pigment being drier and it's got this chalky appearance and you can also see it's um, more vivid. And also just note the, um, the crisp edge of this line over the break in the wall. So the artist would have had to be careful to ensure the clean edge as they continued the line across the panel. Another example of shifting paint application can be seen on the right wing. So this is a little hard to make out. I just wanted to point this out. This is this figure's head and his, from his mouth, all of these red dots are coming out of it. So um, on top of the wing, you can see a group of red dots coming from the mouth, which is we call speech breath. And according to our consistent color ordering, that tells us that although the artist painted the white last on top of the red, the artist chose to make the white transparent enough to see the speech breath dots. On the same wing, you can see a red atlatl stick. I wanted to point this out because it's pretty hard to see. It's right here. And then you can see like a little like feathery shape here. Um, this atlatl stick is almost completely obscured by the white paint, even though it's on the same wing. So you can see that the artist varied the transparency of the white paint to make the speech breath more visible than the atlatl was. And that indicates the importance of the intersection of these red dots with the top portion of the wing. Uh, the fate bell artist also used expressive marks to give parts of the figure more, uh, a more specific quality. So it's, for example, the top of this wing on the central figure uh, uses repeated red gestural lines. So you can see here on this close up, um, the artist chose to represent the feather qual feathery quality of the wing with a more textured mark. 
And interestingly, to the right, you can see another representation of a feather on the dart. So rather than gestural marks, the artist represents the feather with a solid oval form and a line through it. And the ability to represent an object in different ways is a complex and conceptual part of image making. So to render a wing with the quality of a feather through wispy gestural marks, and then more literally on the right with a solid shape that looks like a feather shows us that the skill of the artist, the, the skill of this artist who chooses a type of mark for a specific purpose. And then before I wrapped up on Fate Bell, I just wanted to show the rest of this incredible shelter. Um, so in addition to the panel I've been showing you, on the far left of the site, there are hundreds of other paintings composed throughout the rest of this site that I have yet to study still. And I wanted to point out the really unique morphology here that kind of stages the narrative of um, these different scenes. So this image on the bottom right kind of shows from the side what that kind of staggering of these flat surfaces looks like. And then in the scene um, circled below, you can see how the artist utilizes that flat part of the surface to make a scene on the deep part of the panel, and then extending those really large figures onto the ceiling of the, the shelter. So to conclude, um, Halo Shelter and Fate Bell are both wonderful examples of the complex arrangement of line, shape, and color by the painters of the Lower Pecos. These tools served as visual cues to draw the viewer's eye to openings, to gestural lines, and important parts of the scene. As I continue to study these sites, I know I'm going to find so much more about the uh, compositional elements and how these systems of painting might be shared at other sites. And I just wanted to finish by saying that Painting remains one of the most important traditions of human expression. So creating a discourse for a more critical study of the Lower Pecos rock art process is essential to knowing more about how they saw and experienced their world. And we see the consistent layering of paint order. And we know these murals were planned out and executed strategically. We can also see the variety of brush strokes, whether they were precise or expressive. We see so much different use of line. We even see manipulation of paint with opacity and transparency. And we see the artists using the natural rock surface features to create different types of surfaces. And this indicates that these artists really were masters of their materials and they knew what they were doing to create skilled marks. In addition to this, the Lower Pecos murals are unique expression of the painters who made them and reflect their understanding of life and creation. So my experience as a painter, I see a gesture or a line and I see the hand of the artist. I see a record of a moment in time and I see telling a story. And I also see these marks and these paintings as part of the landscape around them and that they're continuing to tell their story to us and resonating with us as we're, we continue to witness this incredible work. So that's awesome. all I have for y'all today, but thank you. Fantastic. Everyone. Fantastic. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. If you will um, stop sharing your screen and we'll get everybody back together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have some questions for you. Thank you so much. That was so fascinating and such an interesting new way to look at the, the rock out of the lower Pecos. Um, so I'm gonna go down and um, ask some of these questions in the chat and yeah. then we can open it up for more um, after we hit some of these. Um, so the first question was, why is the earlier work more multicolored than the later work? I think this had to do with your slide about the other types, red monochrome, red linear. Um, and it's a difficult question probably to answer and maybe not one, Ashley, that you, um, you know, necessarily feel able to, but if you have a thought on it, absolutely. Um, we, we know that it was intentional for one color. Um, I don't know specifically why, um, but I think that's why I'm so drawn to the Pecos River style is that they intentionally chose such a, you know, beautiful range of colors and types of marks. And so it does make it the most complex and prevalent, but it's something I'm, I think about too, is like, why would they choose just one color for those other forms of, of the painting styles? Yeah. And what we always find as we continue to study the rock art of the Lower Pecos is that everything we learn at leads to a hundred more questions. <laughs> so yes. you have definitely tapped one of them. Yes, that is 
A great question though. Um, next one is, is just a comment. I love imagining how they must have prioritized their art by the fact that they had to prepare scaffolding. Yes, I, I think that that is such a, an important thing to remember is that they were prioritizing this art um, in such a huge way that, as to spend that kind of resource to gather everything that was needed to build scaffolding, that, gather everything that was needed to create this amount of paint, yeah. you know, and to plan out such enormous compositions. And to share with the group, um, just a little bit, we, ha we have been radiocarbon dating Halo Shelter, and we do know that Halo was painted at one time. So as Ashley has been talking about, all of the different ways that the, the, paint, the artist chose to use paint, the artist or artists, um, it, it was done at one time, so it was fully intentional. So really, really exciting, really mm -hmm. interesting. Um, moving down. Are you familiar with the rock paintings in Big Bend uh, Ranch State Park? If so, what style are they? Um, <laughs> I am not, but I'm writing this site down. <laughs> I've heard of the, the rock art here and I'm curious. Yes, um, I, don't, I also don't know what style they are, um, but uh, that is, and you know, there are something too that people don't recognize is that there is rock art everywhere. Rock art is ubiquitous across the globe. Mm -hmm. You will find it in every location. So um, yes, Big Ben has tons, Waco tanks, paint rock. Texas is full of rock art, um, yeah. but so is you know Utah and, and even in the Southeast and obviously in Mexico, I mean, just, it goes forever. So, so fascinating the way that it's all- um, here in New York, surprisingly. Yes, right, exactly. <laughs> Pennsylvania, New York, it's incredible. It's incredible. Um, didn't they also use candelia plants also? Um, probably. I don't know about for paint. This is a question from Carolyn Todd. Mm -hmm. Carolyn, do you want to, um, do, you, do you mean for paint or for brushes or um, just want to make sure I'm answering your question? Uh, yes, for paint, uh, because it's a, it's a native wax succulent. So, uh, ah. Oh, okay. We in our in our studies thus far have have found that they only used the plant base as the um, the soapy kind of a substance that makes the fat and the water combine. But we do have plans to do some more research on what the paint was made of, and so I, I think that we'll get a lot new information. A lot of our um, studies about the paint were done at about twenty years ago, so there's so many new ways to study paint now and we have a resident chemist so um lots more to come on that for sure um i have let's see next question um what are the short horizontal lines oh the bluish purple sorry that i i jumped in on that one because i didn't want people to think that they were painting in blue yeah um, yeah, I see yeah those are the things, things you remember <laughs> yes exactly um does the compositional intentionality lead us to the conclusion that this was a single artist or an artist group painting at a single time? Or are there elements that argue for later additions, deletions over time? That's a great question. I think it really depends on the size of the composition. You know, you see something as large as Halo Shelter, I imagine was several artists, but working together to make sure that the system of painting was consistent. Um, it could have been that Fate Bell, that one section I was looking at, I, I think that might have been possible for one artist, but it's really hard to tell. But you do know whether it was one artist or several, that they were all working together to make sure things, all the marks were consistent, that uh, if they were measuring, that they had the same distance or they were using the same you know stick or whatever kind of stencil they were using to measure. Um, but yeah, that's something I think about too when I'm looking at them is how, how could this have been executed by three or five different artists and you know the the attention and the set of rules they had to follow to make sure it was articulated in the a consistent way yeah it, it's a really good question and one of the ones that we're, we're studying through hearthstone um we do know in terms of deletions that there was scratching after paintings were painted um so that i don't know that that would be uh, you know a deletion I, I mean, I guess that is a kind of deletion, um, the way that they would scratch off certain areas, and, and we believe that they use that paint as, you know, in a powerful way. 
Um, we have not found thus far that um, there were necessarily later additions um, that, you know, we're still working on radiocarbon dating across the, the um, landscape. Um, we shall see, we'll keep you posted. Um, somebody asked if we could describe the wings on the central figure at Fate Bell better. And I think we'll hold on to that one. And if that person would be willing to stay a little bit after, we could certainly bring up that picture again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, another question, are they both, are, were there both men and women artists? That I am, I am not <laughs> sure on, on the, the roles that, the role that gender would play on who was, um, would carry out that task. Um, that I don't know, but is another question I think about is kind of what, what roles certain people played in carrying out this narrative and the importance of this task. Mm -hmm. We do definitely assume that there, you know, probably was the ability and skill in both genders to do this. And there may have been, um, you know, rules around who got to do it. We also know that a lot of the figures were female. So even though we often, as we're talking, we'll say he, you know, he, he has this and he has that, that sometimes can, can belie the fact that there were a lot of female figures and we're still working and Carolyn, um, you know, sitting right here is still working to, to continue those interpretations so that someday when we're having these um, conversations, we can say she and he and feel very, very sure about that. <laughs> Um, are you publishing this work? And if so, where um, can you send a reference? Yes. Um, so I, the intent is to publish this uh, at some point. I would like to organize my data a little better for a you know journal format. And of course, I still have some research to do on um, the rest of Halo, or sorry, not Halo, of Fate Bell, that shelter and kind of the morphology. Um, but yes, that's definitely my intention. But I do have... Um, me and Carolyn published a paper last year about mark making and speech breath. If you haven't read it, um, that's kind of started the preliminary work on what I was thinking about with these sites. So if you if you want to dig a little deeper, that would be the the article to read. Yes. Awesome. Um, why the so the next question is why these specific locations? Why were the paintings in these specific locations? I think. Ah, oh, yes. Um, that's part of the geographical analysis that the, the Schumel team is doing. We know that the sites they, they chose had in, incredible spiritual significance. It was part of um, their journey. Um, they would choose a site and usually they would go to the site, make the mural there. And they, it was, correct me if I'm wrong, it was not a site where they would, they occupied for a period of time after that. It, they were meant like a, almost like a pilgrimage to make this mural and then they would continue. Um, they were nomadic, so they didn't stay in one place very long. So yeah, some of the sites were occupied over and over and over and over again, nomadically throughout the centuries and other sites seem to have been primarily ceremonial and don't have a lot of occupation um, archeology span or debris. And so it, that is definitely something that we're looking into is what's the difference? Why were some sites specific to that kind of maybe ceremony or ritual and not a place where they you know, were living? And why were other sites places where they were living constantly and, and also you know, painted extensively? All right, for the images you've showed us, do you think that there was one artist or more? So we, um, we talked a little bit about that. And we have, um, uh, so what is the radiocarbon date? We are still working on that. We will be uh, announcing that very soon. Um, so hold tight. And if you don't um, subscribe to our e-newsletter, we usually send out information like that through our e-newsletter. Sometimes we have to um, publish things first. There's a whole thing about in science about you can't publish something if it's already been published. And sometimes they consider an e-newsletter publishing so but we will get the information out to you when we have it and um and yes we're very excited to, to learn about that it just came in yesterday uh, this is how how soon it is and the landowners don't even know so we can't really share it before they know <laughs> um so someone said there's rock art in vermont too absolutely yes i think um, i know vermont site too <laughs> 
You what? I think I did visit a site in Vermont. It was um, did you? <laughs> yeah, they were petroglyphs. Mm -hmm. Now I know it's one o'clock and many of you will have to drop off. And if you do, thank you so much for being here. We will continue through some more questions, yes. but if you have to go, thank you for being here. Con consider right. supporting us and we appreciate you so much. Yes, thank you for all the wonderful questions and for listening to me today. Yes, thank you. So well, if you're okay, Ashley, we can continue with just a few more questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, was there any use of negative space, the of use of negative space that you noticed in the works? Oh, absolutely. And I think that um, was most prevalent in Halo Shelter with the organization of all of those figures concentrated in the center. And then you see the negative space around them and then that serpentine line. Um, but you also see it in Fate Bell, the negative spacing in between each figure. Um, it's really important to showing like where, where they are in that circular path around the main winged figure. Um, but negative space was so important to developing figure relationships and also showing that hierarchy of figures. So what figures have more narrative prominence and which figures are like going back into the space. So it's yeah. an really important compositional tool. Definitely. Um, next question. Has your research determined the type of binder agent on the pigments? And I can take this one. Um, thus far, we believe that it was bone marrow, the fatty, uh, fatty bone marrow substance from an ungulate, which would be a, a deer um, type animal. Um, we, again, are going to do some more research on that, but that that would have been really significant because that would have been some of the best food a hunter-gatherer, nomadic hunter-gatherer could possibly have had. And so to take that off their plate and make paint with it really means that they believe that paint and that painting is, is a survival tool. So really exciting, stay tuned on um, more there. Looking at how the lines were created, especially the more gestural lines, can you tell anything about handedness, left or right handedness? Yes, um, I think that's hard to tell because you know you if anyone's ambidextrous, you can train yourself to use either um, right or left hand. But I think with splatter, you can really tell because that indicates uh, what direct what um, angle you would be approaching the surface from. Um, but yeah, that's something I think about too when I'm looking at the panel. Um, doing some of those more directional marks would be a little harder with the left hand, but they would still be possible. And we know that the, the artists were very skilled in using the, the, the implements that they painted with. So I think it's possible like either right or left hand or even both. Yeah. Um, some, some wonderful, wonderful comments in the chat. Ashley, this is so incredible and interesting. Thank you very much for sharing all of this artwork and information. Um, Ashley put in the chat the um, article mapping the multi-sensory experience so that you can see that there. Um, let me see if we have any other questions. Nope, it's just a lot of love for you, Ashley. It's just a lot, a lot of love. <laughs> oh, my heart is full. Uh, thank you everyone for, for coming and listening to the research that I've been doing. And I hope that, you know, like this is going to be, this is going to be so fruitful for just so much more. And um, I'm just really excited to start working on the next site. Absolutely. We are too. Well, thank you so much, Ashley. Fabulous, fabulous presentation. Thank you everybody for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.